This series affirms the university's civic mission as a public institution for educating students who are thoughtful, responsible, and engaged citizens. The idea for this annual commemoration of the Civil Rights Movement grew out of an African American Studies course tracing the Civil Rights Movement, which Professor Balkrin and Dr. Page chaperoned and team taught in the summer of 2010. During that innovative course, 20 students accompanied Balkrin and Page on a bus trip that retraced the route of the Civil Rights Movement through Birmingham and Montgomery, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, and Memphis, Tennessee, where they met for informative interviews and lively discussions with numerous civil rights, with numerous uh, civil rights activists. Since 2010, Professors Balkrin and Dr. Page have hosted several prominent figures in the civil rights movement, including the Reverend Samuel Billy Kiles, a close friend of Martin Luther King, who was with him at the moment of his assassination in Memphis, Tennessee. A.C. Roper, who currently serves as police chief for the city of Birmingham, Alabama. The Reverend Arthur Price, Jr., pastor of the 16th Street Baptist Church of Birmingham, Alabama. The Honorable A.C. Wharton, the current mayor for the city of Memphis, Tennessee, and most recently, Ms. Peggy Wallace Kennedy, the daughter of Governor George Wallace, who has emerged as a strong voice in support of civil rights. We're pleased to welcome Mr. Gray as the latest in this group of distinguished speakers, and we thank all of you for joining us to help commemorate this defining chapter in American history, which continues to defend our national agenda. I'd now like to invite Mr. Professor Balkman to the podium. Thank you. speaker. Uh, some of the folks have been supporting me here for the past four or five years, uh, the Civil Rights Project here at CCSU. Academic Affairs, Dr. Joe Page and Dr. Carl Lovett. Office of our Student Conduct, Christopher Dukes. I think he deserves a round of applause. Very instrumental in assisting me. Um, last semester, this was thanks a lot for supporting diversity. Um, student Affairs, Dr. Laura Todenti. I saw her somewhere. Very active, again, the student affairs are very active in support of civil rights at the university. Alumni Foundation, Christopher Gallagher and Nick Pettico, they're unable to be here because of previous engagement. Uh, School of Business, Dean Seamack, I'm not sure if he's here. And Criminal Justice Chair, Kathleen Bankley, I know I saw her earlier today. Uh, thank you for your kind support. Uh, last and no means least, uh, Target Foundation. I'm not sure if Target Foundation is here. Uh, the law firm of Dave Pitney, Farmington Bank, I saw Christine somewhere earlier, Farmington Bank, Rockville Bank, and People's Bank. I want to thank these uh, organizations for supporting diversity and education. Last, uh, Ralph Roy. Um, most of you guys don't know who Ralph Roy is. If you ever look at some of the photos with Dr. King, there's always a white guy next to him, marching for civil rights. That's the white guy right here. Right here. So I'm trying to write this book right now, so we gotta, we got to do this. Got to do it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Pomodoro Luther King reminded us there are two types of laws, just law and unjust law. He also reminded us that racism in America was legally sanctioned under the institution of slavery and during the Jim Crow era. Our distinguished speaker has spent his entire life fighting to amend America's cancer. After being impossible to gain acceptance into law school in Alabama because of the color of his skin, he vowed, and I quote,
to become a lawyer, return to Alabama, and end and destroy everything segregated he could find, end of quote. And boy, has he done that. At the age of 24, he represented Mrs. Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King, started the modern day civil rights movement in 1955, which initiated the Montgomery bus, bus boycott. Mr. Fred Gray was born in Montgomery, Alabama, is a graduate of Nashville Christian Institute, Alabama State University, and Case Western Reserve University Law School. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to CCSU civil rights activist, Mr. Fred Gray. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Is, is that better? Okay. To the presiding officer, to uh, Professor Stephen Balleron, to the other members of the faculty and staff, and most of all to you students of Connecticut Central State University. Let me first express my genuine appreciation to Stephen for all the hard work he has done. He has been in touch with me for almost a half a year trying to convince me that I should come here to speak to you today. And I know he has encountered a lot of hard work, a lot of things that uh, has taken place and at certain points we didn't think it was going to uh, occur, uh, notwithstanding the weather and some other problems we had yesterday when it was all ready to go and got a call from the airlines telling us that our plane had been canceled. But uh, my wife decided she would drive me over to Atlanta and we caught our plane. So we're very happy that Carol is able to be with us. Thank you, Carol. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> Let me just say to your students and to the administration, I think you are fortunate when you have a person like Stephen who has worked so hard on this project. I know he has worked hard because he has called me so many times. I don't know whether there has been any place I have been invited to that I have been called upon as much and have incurred as many problems. And I finally, at one point, I just about decided not to come. But I concluded that he had worked so hard on this project that I was going to come just because he worked hard. So let's give him a hand for doing what he's done. When he wrote me, and I want to share with you what he told me, he said, my apology for emailing you out of the clear blue. The reason behind it is he wanted me to come and be with you today, and I'm delighted to be here. That was my first real introduction to this university. Everybody has heard about UConn. Everybody has heard about Yale. But Alabama is a long way from Connecticut. And many of us had not heard about your university. But I realize the fact that whether you are attending a university in Alabama or in Connecticut, 
uh, in Northeast Missouri, up at Truman University where I was two weeks ago. Basically the problems that we have in this country are basically the same. When I was asked to speak, I always ask, and I asked Stephen about what you want me to talk about. And he ended up telling me, tell us a little something about how you became involved in the Civil Rights Movement, why it was necessary to have the Civil Rights Movement in the first place, how was it in working with Dr. King and Mrs. Rosa Parks? And then he says, say a little something about Dixon versus Alabama State University because that is the case where students who at Alabama State College wanted to become involved in the city-in movement like the students up at a and and they were expelled. As a result of that, I filed a lawsuit that changed the whole law concerning the rights, not only of students having a right to procedural and substantive due process before expulsion, but it has been extended to employment, so it changed the whole law of employment and has created three or four different organizations. And many people are now members of these organizations and have no idea that it all started with students. So let me just briefly tell you, uh, I'm not a person who always wanted to be a lawyer. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama, 83 years ago. And at the time of my birth, everything in Alabama was completely segregated. Now, I realize that many of you young people don't know anything about white water and colored water. You don't know anything about separate rating rooms. You don't know anything about the fact that you could drive all the way from Kentucky to Florida, and if you were African American, you had to be very careful where you stopped because you couldn't use restrooms even at service stations. And you couldn't find a place to eat, even though you may have had a little money. And as I was growing up in Montgomery in the 40s, there were only about two real professions that an African-American boy could think about becoming. And some of you older people may know about it. But one of them was what? One was a teacher, and the second one was what? Was to be a preacher. So I, was, I decided to be both. And as a result of that, my mother sent me to our church school up in Nashville. And I have a stepbrother who lives over in Bloomfield, and I see his daughter has just come in, and we're happy that she's here. We went over and saw them earlier, Bloomfield, earlier today. So after finishing high school and learning a little something about how to preach, I returned home to Montgomery to go to Alabama State College for Negroes. That was the historical black college in Montgomery. I lived on the west side of town. Alabama State was on the east side of town. I had to use the public transportation as my means of traveling and use that facility from as little as twice a day to as much as eight times a day. I saw how people mistreated on buses. One person was killed as a result of an altercation on the buses. There were times when you would pay your money in the front, they would ask you to get out and go in the back door because white people were standing in the front and sometimes the bus driver would walk off and leave you. 
I also realized that everything then in Montgomery and Alabama and across the South and in many places across this nation was completely segregated based on race. So I concluded that I thought persons should not only be able to ultimately have their souls saved after death, but that they should be able to enjoy some of those constitutional rights while they live. So when I was a junior at Alabama State in 1950, I made a secret commitment. First, I was going to finish Alabama State College. Secondly, I was going to go to law school someplace. Not apply to the University of Alabama because I knew they wouldn't admit me. And at that time, Alabama, as all of the southern states, had a program. If the course was offered at the historical white institution and not offered at the historical black college, the state of Alabama would pay a portion of your tuition room and board. The only problem with that was on a reimbursement basis. You had to pay it before you could get it back. But I decided I would do that. But that was another part of it. The other part was I was going to finish, go to somebody's law school, finish law school, come back to Alabama, take the bar exam, even though at that time if you attended the University of Alabama and graduated, you didn't even have to take the bar exam. You were admitted on motion. And the other part of it that I kept secret was I was going to become a lawyer after passing the bar exam and destroy everything segregated at the time. Now, for a teenager in Alabama in the early 50s, to think about that was almost unheard of. I finished Alabama State in May of 51, enrolled in Western Reserve University, now Case Western in Cleveland, in September of 51. Graduated in three years, in June of 54. And I decided I would stop by Columbus, Ohio, just in case and took the Ohio bar exam. <laughs> and six weeks later, in the latter part of July of 1954, I took the Alabama bar exam. And in, and in August of 54, I was advised by both the Alabama bar and the Ohio bar that I had passed the first, I had passed the first time I took the exam and became licensed to practice in Alabama on September the 7th, 1954. And I have been practicing law in Montgomery since that time and left my office yesterday at one o'clock en route to come up here to be with you today. Now, if you have read anything about my history, you know that I represented Rosa Parks, and you know I represented uh, Dr. King. And you know that I represented the people in the Montgomery Bus Boycott. But those were not my first, was not my first civil rights case. And you know there's always something about your first something, whether it's your first love or whatever it is. It's something about the first things. <laughs> My first case was that of a 15-year-old girl whose name is Claudette Carvin. Claudette Carvin was a high school student in Montgomery who used a public transportation system to go to and from school. This is in 1955 now. The same type problems that I had experienced in 19... 50 in 1948 through 1951 when I was at Alabama State. She went, she would have to go down, take a bus, go downtown, get another bus, go to school, and reverse it in the afternoon. That was a procedure in Montgomery at the time that the first 10 seats, two on the side and two on the front, were always reserved for white people whether they came or not. She didn't sit in those seats. 
But she sat in another seat, in a seat that she had sat in many times. But on this particular day, March the 2nd, 1955, there were more white people on the bus than usual. And when all of the seats were taken and white people had to stand, the bus driver asked Claudette to give up her seat to a white person. And she refused. She said she had taken a, a, a course in civics and her teacher had told her that she had constitutional rights, she had paid her money just like the white person had and she wasn't going to get up and she didn't get up. What happened is Claudette was arrested. She called her parents after getting arrested, charged with being a delinquent. Her parents called Mr. E.D. Nixon, who was Mr. Civil Rights in Montgomery. Mr. Nixon called Fred Gray, the lawyer just out of law school that I had known and I knew his wife and he was a family friend of ours. He had been the president of the NACP and he wanted to know if I would represent this girl and I told him I would. That was my first case. I represented Claudette Carlin in the juvenile court of Montgomery County before Judge Hill. There were several people who came to Claudette's rescue. Joanne Robinson, who was a teacher at Alabama State that I knew, who had had an experience, a bad experience on a bus in Montgomery back in 1948. She's now president of the Women's Political Council, and they were keeping a record of all these incidents. E.D. Nixon, of course, who had recommended me to represent her, and then there was Rosa Parks, who was the secretary to the Montgomery County branch of the NACP and also youth director. And Claudia Carvey had attended some of her youth courses. We complained to the city. We complained to the bus company about Claudette's situation. And they said they were sorry about it and nothing. And, and they would be sure it wouldn't happen again. And then when I went before Judge Hill and raised the fact that Claudette is not a delinquent, she's a good student, all she was trying to do was to enforce her constitutional rights, and I raised those issues. But Judge Hill didn't listen to me. He declared her to be a delinquent, placed her on unsupervised probation, and that was a threat that we would Stay off of the buses. But our community wasn't quite ready and they promised that conditions would improve and they didn't. We later found out that after Claudette's arrest, there was another young lady, Mary Louise Smith, who in October of 1955 had had a similar experience. And of course, I had been working with Mrs. Rosa Parks and she knew, and I knew her, she had been uh, uh, working with the NACP. Her office, or she worked at a department store that was just a block and a half from my office. And every day, from the time I started practicing law in 1955 until 1954, until she was arrested on December the 1st, 1955, she would come to my office about five days a week. We would talk about youth. We would talk about the problems we had on the buses. We talked about how a per what a person should do in the event that they were ever arrested. And even on the day of her arrest, we had had lunch, and I told her I was going out of town. I take the time to tell you all of this because the Montgomery bus boycott is considered by many historians to have been the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. And there are so many misconceptions about it, and there were only a few people who really knew about it. So when I talked to Mrs. Parks that day, I knew and she knew that if the opportunity ever presented itself, and she was asked to get up and give her seat to a white person, she wasn't going to get up. 
And she knew exactly what to do. And she also knew she weren't going to sit in those first ten seats. She went on about her business. I went out of town on my engagement as she knew. And when I came back, I had phone calls from her and everybody else telling me that Mrs. Parks had been arrested. And I had a phone call. And she was asking me to come to her house when I returned that call. I went over to Mrs. Parks' house on the evening of December the 1st, 1955. She told me what happened and told me that her trial was going to be the next Monday on the 5th, and she wanted me to represent her. This now is another opportunity that I have in order to begin to destroy everything segregated I could find. But I had enough sense to know that one little lawyer just out of law school couldn't do it. So I told Mrs. Parks, don't worry about your case. We'll have it ready for Monday. This is Thursday evening. But I left her house and went to Mr. E.D. Nixon house. He was the Mr. Civil Rights who had recommended me to uh, Claudette Common. He was a Pullman car puller. And he said, Fred, if we're going to do anything, now is the time to do it. He wasn't a man who did a lot of planning. He was an action person. And I said, well, if we're going to do it, Mr. Nixon, now is the time. I told him that I was going to go and talk to Joanne Robinson. Joanne was a teacher who had had a problem, who was a planner. I went across town and talked to Joanne Robinson, and we sat in her living room on the evening of December 1st and the morning of December 2nd and plan the details for the Montgomery Bus Boycott. There were a couple of things we had to do. One, we concluded that if we're going to ever do anything about the buses, now is the time. Two, Joanne said we need to tell the people to stay off of the buses on Monday as a protest. And she said, I'm going to prepare some leaflets to be distributed over the weekend to say another black woman has been arrested and we're going to stay off of the buses when her trial takes place on Monday the 5th. Then we concluded that how are we going to get that message out? They said, black preachers have more people in their audience on Sunday morning than anybody else, so we got to get the black preachers. Uh, 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 with us. And I said, that's fine. Then we said, well, somebody has got to be the spokesman. Who's going to be the spokesman? There were two leaders in Montgomery at the time. One of them was E.D. Nixon, who I've told you about. And the other one was a man named Rufus Lewis. Rufus Lewis only was interested in voter registration and getting people elected to office and having them have good administrations. We were afraid, Joanne and I, that if we accepted either one of those persons as the spokesman, we'd lose somebody else's support. So Joanne said, I'll tell you who we ought to get. She said, let's get my pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's only been here a year. He hadn't been involved in any civil rights activities but he can move people with words. I said, well, I've met Dr. King. I don't know him like you. If you think, that's fine. I said, now let's find two role, a role for these other two men. I, I told Joanne, I said, here's what. E.D. Nixon is a Pullman car photo. He knows A. Philip Randolph, the black labor leader of his union in New York, make him treasurer, and they'll be able to find some money to help keep people off of the buses. And the other person, Rufus Lewis, in addition to owning the Citizen Club, and you had to be a member in order to get there, his wife, Jewel, was co-owner of the largest funeral home in town. And if we're going to ask people to stay off of the buses, funeral homes have automobiles, and they don't use those automobiles until they have funerals. Let's make him chairman of the Transportation Committee. We then spread it through because she couldn't tell people that she was involved in it because she would have been fired from her state job. 
I couldn't tell them that the young lawyer just out of law school uh, was involved because they would say I'd be stirring up litigation and they would have disbarred me. But that was the plan. And do you know what? When the official meeting took place, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was selected to be the spokesman and he was not at the meeting at the time he was selected. E.D. Nixon was selected treasurer. Rufus Lewis was selected chairman of the Transportation Committee. The young lawyer just out of law school was selected the lawyer for the movement. And when Dr. King spoke at that, when the buses rolled that Monday morning, nobody was on them. And when we had that meeting at Old Street Baptist Church that night and Dr. King made his speech, everybody knew we had made the right decision and the rest of his history. What I want you to understand is, it didn't just happen. It was planned. As you begin today, and as you think about where we are in the civil rights movement, we want you to understand that these things do not just happen. We've come a long way. That was my first case. But since then, I have handled cases that has ended transportation, this segregation in transportation. We have had cases that have ended, uh, uh, that have protected the right to vote, the right for membership organization, equal access to farm subsidies, health care, the rights to juries. So then, as we meet here today, and as we discuss and see where we are, the question really is, and that's before us, where are we today and where do we go from here? Conditions in Alabama and the South have changed substantially. In the 50s, we were concerned primarily about destroying overt discrimination which was sanctioned by law. Now we are fortunate enough to have a person of color who is president of the United States as well as a person of color who is attorney general of the United States. I believe what we did during the civil rights movement assisted greatly in the election of President Obama. What I am saying is what we all did during the civil rights movement has made a substantial contribution toward that end. The struggle continues, but the roots have been planted. Each of you have what you need to continue growing and branching out toward a nation of equality as we travel on the road toward equal justice. The history of the civil rights movement and the progress which has been made need to needs to be preserved for the current and future generation. We now have a current generation who knew nothing at all about segregation and discrimination. What we have done in Tuskegee, Alabama is founded the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center, a 501c3 corporation. And that corporation is for the purpose of showing the contributions made by people who lived on the land to show the contributions made by the people in the infamous Tuskegee Syphilis study that I represented and many of the first civil rights cases, including the first civil rights, uh, the right cases in order to vote was started in Tuskegee, Alabama, and most people don't know about it. So we have started that organization, and if you're interested, after this mission, I'd be happy to talk with you about it. As you know, and I know my time is running out, diversity is very important. And I think as I listen to persons who are organizations that were involved in the sponsorship of this program, it includes diversity. But every one of us, regardless of our race and our national origin, have something substantial to contribute. And we need to use that experience, what we have, in order to improve diversity. 
It is important that we form a coalition of people of all walks of life, regardless of their race, creed, color, or national origin, in order for us to be able to truly enjoy all of the rights and privileges that our Constitution give us. There are many people who believe that with Barack Obama being elected President of the United States of America, and that Dr. King's dream has truly been fulfilled. There are those who believe that because of that fact, all African American and other persons now have all of the rights that they are guaranteed. They believe that we have arrived and all persons have equal justice under the law. But I want you to know today, this afternoon, that is not true. The Marathon Civil Rights Movement began with the arrest of Mrs. Parks on December 1st, as I've indicated to you. And as it set out in my autobiography, Bus Ride to Justice, however, the struggle for equal justice continues, notwithstanding the progress in recent years. We have seen an increase in racism, including burning of churches and resurgence of hate groups. This activity has increased since Mr. Obama has become president. The United States Supreme Court for over a century, a quarter of a century, pioneered the rights of minorities, including women. But in recent years, there has been a change, and that court has now began to make changes. Last year, it decided unconstitutional a part of the Voting Rights Act, and that Voting Rights Act is what has caused us to be able to enjoy many of the rights and privileges we, we now enjoy. We have also seen in the United States District Courts and the Courts of Appeals across the nation, in my opinion, the federal courts for the most part are no longer protecting the rights of individuals and minorities, including women. We have, been, we have seen an assault on affirmative action and other constitutional safeguards that have protected the rights of individuals in this country. We even have some people who are verbally attacking the president. Now, what does all of what I have discussed with you mean to those participating in this program on February 19th to 20th here at this university? It means the struggle for equal justice continues. I want to leave you with a challenge. If what I have said to you mean anything, it means, unfortunately, that racism is still alive in this country. If the life and work of Dr. King means anything, it means that the struggle continues for equal justice under the law, particularly for women and minorities. It means there is a real challenge as to whether the gains we have obtained will continue or whether we will lose them. If we lose, it means that Dr. King and those who have given their lives for the protection of human and civil rights will have died in vain. If we lose, the nation loses. The struggle has not ended. Racial discrimination in this country has not ended. We do not have a level playing field. There is no such thing as a race-neutral society in America. The consequences of over 350 years of slavery, segregation, and discrimination has not ended with the passage of civil rights legislation in Dr. King's I Have a Dream and the election of President Obama. Unfortunately, discrimination against African Americans and other minorities in this country is still alive and well. We still, for the most part, live in a racist society and it's wrong. I don't have the time to tell you, but if you believe that African Americans and other minorities now enjoy all of the rights and privileges as the majority, 
I invite you to read the National Urban League report for 2013 on the state of black America, the dreams, jobs, rebuilding America. And that report interprets the relative status of blacks and whites in American social society measured according to five areas, economics, health, education, social justice, and civil engagement. It discloses that the disparity between the job, or between the majority and the minorities is greater and is reducing very little. The 209 report stated that African Americans are twice as likely as whites to be unemployed, three times more likely than whites to live in poverty, and more than 16 times as likely to be incarcerated. What does all of that mean? What does all of that mean is that the struggle for equal justice continues. I want to conclude by asking you, where do we go from here? I wish I could tell you that everything is rosy, but it's not. We still have serious problems. And what I tell all the audiences I talk with, whether they are white or whether they are black, and that is the struggle for equal justice continues. And there are several things that I think we need to do. One, we need to recognize the fact that racism is still a problem in this country, and we need to do something about it. Secondly, racism is not going to go away by itself. The Montgomery bus boycott didn't start by itself. There had to be a plan. If you find that there are problems in your communities, come up with a plan. Nobody told me what to do when I saw what was going on in Montgomery. But you need a plan. Secondly, or third, a plan is no good unless you implement it. And then finally, everybody wants to solve problems. But you know what? We always want somebody else to solve these problems. If the problems that you have in your community, whether they are racial or otherwise, if they're going to be solved, you can't depend upon your neighbor to solve it. You're going to have to be a part of it. The racism in this country is so ingrained, it's going to take all the governmental agencies, all the religious organizations, all the social organizations, all the fraternities and all the sororities, and all of us working together to try to solve these problems. And I say to you young people, and I want to leave you with what then Governor Wilder, the first African American governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia said when he was being inaugurated several years ago, and I want to leave this with you. And this is what he said. I want them to know that oppression can be lifted, that discrimination can be eliminated, that poverty need not be binding, that disability can be overcome, and that the offer of opportunities in a free society carries with it the requirements of hard work, the rejection of drugs and other false highs, and a willingness to work with others, whatever their race or national origin may be. Let us be busy about the work of sowing good seeds and fertile minds to help a new generation expand its wings and soar to higher heights. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start the Q and A, I want to um, just read a proclamation from the city of Hartford, Mayor Pedro Segarra, he was unable to be here today. But he says, the Mayor City of Hartford, along with the Court of Common Council and the residents, 
uh, of the City of Hartford do hereby proclaim February 19, 2014 as Mr. Fred Gray Day in the City of Hartford. So, something from the town mayor. Also, from our governor, uh, Darren Malloy, uh, quite similar to uh, his proclamation, he's not going to be here today because of our prior commitments, but it is also Fred Gray Day, State of Connecticut. So, enjoy all the great days. from the students and faculty and staff. Well, I could be the icebreaker. I want to question, pose a question. When you started the, the movement in 55, do you think it would have been what it was? Uh, no, we didn't start out with the idea of starting a movement. What we recognized in Montgomery was we had a problem. We had a real problem on our buses. And I don't think we could have done, we couldn't have taken any other area. We couldn't have taken schools, we couldn't have taken churches, we couldn't have taken playgrounds. I think everybody in Montgomery knew that we were having serious problems on the buses and we needed the bus transportation system. So it starts out with a need and we came up with a way to solve that need. But as we were trying to solve the need, the opposition became stronger and stronger. And as it became stronger, we had to change our strategy. And it ended up developing where over 40,000 individuals of color stayed off of buses for 300 and some days until they could go back in a dignified fashion. But it didn't start out to be a movement. All the way to back. What do you think that the um, present day issues are regarding the civil rights as an extension of what you dealt with in the difference in the civil rights issues? Well, they are basically, and I alluded to it and did not have time to go into it. I, I wish you would read the National Urban League report. They make a report every year to the president. And what you will find in that, that while we have made during the last few years some progress, but the disparity, whether it's infant mortality or whether it's life expectancy, uh, the majority live longer, the, uh, uh, their infants live longer, they earn more money, they own more property, they uh, have better jobs, their income is higher, they have better health care. Any of those five areas that I mentioned to you, the disparity between them. And one of the greatest ones, really, is the matter of lack of education, because we still haven't solved that problem and we still have lack of jobs, and we still have lack of proper health care. And until we can get that, those disparities closer together, and until we recognize a part of the problem, and I don't stand here to tell you all of it is race, but part of it is, and part of it has been generated over the years, and we need to work on it. Over back. Uh, yeah. So how does, how does a society that's ingrained and run economically, and all, seemingly a lot of these issues do stem, uh, the changing these issues stem from an economic basis, how do you go about just adding, aside from redistribution of wealth or something of that nature, how do we get more money into schools? How do we get more money into food programs? How do we get more money into job interview programs, anything like that? How do we redistribute wealth to schools and to after school programs and communities? How do, how do we redistribute wealth? Well, not, well not, uh, I, I've never had much wealth, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't really be a, a proper person to answer that question, but let me hasten, sir that education, now, 
Proper education is a part of the key to solving these problems. It's not all, but it's part of the key. But uh, it's very difficult, and nobody is telling a person because you have earned all your money, then you just turn around and just distribute it to everybody. But we believe that we should have a government which should afford individuals, even though they don't have wealth, an opportunity to prepare themselves so that they can make a decent living for themselves and their families. Go ahead. Okay, actually, in, in, in the case of E.D. Nixon, it just happened that he was a Pullman car puller. He was a member of the union. He was an official of his local union. He did know A. Philip Randolph, who was the president of the union. And uh, A. Philip Randolph knew that uh, E.D. Nixon was working in civil rights. And of course, they recognized that the problem we had when Nixon presented it to them, they thought it was a, a good thing that we were doing. They saw we had support of the local community and they were willing to do it. And I think other groups, whether they are labor unions or whether they are churches or whether they are social groups, of whether they are political groups. If you see people with a problem and they're working on those problems, if you get out there and ask somebody to help, frequently you'll get help, and I still believe that we can today. All the way back, Dr. Blitz. Uh, what civil rights aspects do you see in the Stand Your Ground laws? that have played a role in the Trayvon Martin case and now in the Jordan Davis case? Well, well, you know, there have been so much talk about and so much written about the uh, standalone laws. So, you know, all of these states have their own individual laws so far as criminal laws are concerned. I think that without, and I don't profess to be an expert in criminal law, but I think each of the states should have a proper criminal justice system so that a person should be able to walk or run or be involved or going walking in communities and they should be able to walk in those communities as long as they conduct themselves properly without any fear of being stopped or interfered with are shot and killed. Last one, I swear. Yeah, speak a little louder. All right, last one, I swear. Um, it, it seems to me like there's a portion of pop culture that's that's leading towards the some discrimination or some some discriminating ideas about uh, minorities, specifically how they're portrayed in media, how minorities are the music, things of that nature. Do you have anything to comment about that? The role of media and the way it's the role of media and the way it's portrayed minorities. Well, as you know, the, the one thing about the media, and uh, they have control of the media. They have the last word. And uh, what we tried to do during the movement and I may not be answering your question, but uh, what we tried to do during the movement was to convince the media 
just like we were convincing everybody else that the cause we have is a worthy cause and it is the right cause and we are not doing it for personal gain or for political gain but we are doing it because it is the right thing to do and we believe that our conduct is constitutionally protected and I think if you present it that way you would hope that the media would present it in the same fashion Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But. Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, I'd just like to know if, uh, what do you think the best idea or best way to change the disparity in education would be? Which direction would you use? I don't have one, I'm sorry. <laughs> but let me, let me tell you what I tell, uh, what I tell particularly students. And this is what I'll end up telling these uh, law students tomorrow at Yale. And that is, nobody told me when I was a teenager and saw the problems we had on the buses in Montgomery, how to solve those problems. I recognized it was a problem, and then in my own little mind, I thought what I thought I could do. So I say to you young people, you have a lot more knowledge, a lot more experience, a lot more technology than your parents had or than my generation had. You can see, if you open your eyes, you will see problems in your community that needs to be addressed whether they are racial, whether they are social, or whatever they are. If you feel that it is a substantial problem, then you talk to other people about it. I didn't just go out on my own, because I couldn't have done it alone. But I sought people out. Now let me even say that after I, I wanted to do the legal work, then after they selected me to do the legal work, guess what? I got scared. <laughs> And what did I do? In less than two weeks after they selected me, I got on the telephone. I had heard about Mr. Thurgood Marshall in New York, who then was the legal voice for the NAACP. I got his phone number and called him. I said, Mr. Marshall, I told him who it was, what I was doing. He read about what was going on. I said, I need your help. They've, they've given me the responsibility of handling the legal work, and I don't know what to do. But I think we need to file a lawsuit, and I'm going to prepare a draft, and I want to come to New York to your office and talk to you or some of your assistants and get some help. And guess what? He immediately told me to come on to New York. First time I went to New York, I went. I met Mr. Marshall. I met his assistant, Robert Carter, and established a relationship with the NACP and the Legal Defense Fund from that December 1955 day until this day, I still have a good working relationship. So if you get involved in something, talk about it, and you can get some help. Young lady. Yeah, yeah, get ahead of us. Where the tactics of the civil rights, where the tactics of the civil rights were they came from? The tactics, yeah, of the civil rights were I don't think anybody just sat down and, and, and said, this is the way we ought to do it. I think each instance, you have to see what the problem is. In Montgomery, we decided. Two things. One, we were going to stay off of the buses as a protest, but I knew just staying off of the buses would never change the law. We had to file a lawsuit also, and that's where I got some legal help. Then when the students up at AT&T in 1960, when they seen what we had done in Montgomery, those kids decided, well, these lunch counters here in the Carolinas ought to be integrated.
So what did they decide to do? They decided to go down to Woodworth and sit. And they did. And they started a whole movement that resulted in the passage of the Public Accommodation Act. So you don't just necessarily, you have a problem and, and you try to come up with something to solve the problem. All the way across here, the back. desegregate the schools. I filed lawsuits that desegregated all of the institutions of higher learning, including Auburn University, Franklin versus Auburn, and Malone versus the University of Alabama. Uh, and Walter uh, Wilkie Gunn, a young man from Connecticut, who I talked with earlier and, and indicated he may be here today. I don't think he has made it, but he was from Alabama, and he, I filed a suit for him to desegregate the University of North Alabama. Uh, and then I filed lawsuits in 105 of the, of the 119 school systems in Alabama. But the purpose of the lawsuits weren't just for the purpose of desegregating the schools, but it was for quality education. And unfortunately, in some of those instances, as time has passed, we still don't have quality education. So I think it's important as we move in the field of education, particularly, that we need to be sure that whatever our situation is, that the end result is to try to have quality education because if our educational system is not educating our children, then we're going to continue to have more people on the welfare road than there should be. Because if you educate them and give them an opportunity, they ought to be able to take a, get a job and take care of themselves. Last question, and leave last question. If they fire an economy, is the boycott still possible? Today's economy is boycotts. Is that possible? Uh, let me tell you, we did not call what we did in Montgomery a boycott during the time it took place. Now, there were other people who called it a boycott, but we referred to it as a protest. Now, there were, at the time in Alabama, a statute which prohibited boycotting a business without just cause or legal excuse. Now, I think we had just cause or legal excuse to boycott, but we didn't call it that. We just told them, all we're going to do is stay off the buses. Now, you call it what you want, but we don't think that amount to boycott it. But selective buying, or whatever you want to call it, I think people have a right to use whatever weapons they have legally in order to help solve their problems. Well, we shop where we eat, where we choose. You know, I, I think individuals and groups of individuals, if they see certain problems with certain businesses or services that persons are performing, and if they decide they want to not use those services and use some other services that they feel more comfortable using, then I think they should be free to do that. I just want to ask one quick question, and then the last question. 
Uh, two of the major issues that define us in the 21st century, obviously, we see the rise of gay rights. Do you think that gay rights is a civil rights issue? Well, you know, I think there are a lot of rights out there. I devoted, I decided the particular rights that I was interested in working on. You can't work on all of them. You have religious rights, you have gay rights, you have a lot of people who have a lot of rights and a lot of these rights are protected under the Constitution. I elected because I saw that problems that black folks who looked like me was having in Alabama. I decided that was going to be my life's work and for almost 60 years that's what it has been and I think everybody else should do whatever they want to do about where they want to devote their time and efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. And if you want to be Mr. Gray, we'll be right here after the lecture.